All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second Gen Chem study session of this semester. Uh, we want to give a special welcome to Dr. Taylor for donating her time uh, on this lovely Sunday afternoon. Uh, just so everyone is aware, this will be recorded and posted at a later date, so stay tuned for that. Uh, with that being said, welcome Dr. Taylor. The floor is yours. Fabulous. Um, so I always like to start off with what is going to be on the exam, and you might notice this is in fact a screenshot from the 701 section. Um, so we do often post this uh, in that Kim 1312 701 section uh, over in e-learning. So this is just that announcement screenshotted and put over here. Um, but I do that because that way, well, one, because it was already done for me, uh, and two, because it that way it's the same message repeated. Uh, so this is basically that last little bit of chapter 14. Uh, the one of the things to note is, is that this is only first order half-lives. So one of the things that we have done this semester in incorporating workshops into uh, the classes is there's some content that we have removed from exams. Uh, as well as from lecture, and we used to do half-lives for both second order and zero order, because you, you can, um, but you'll only be tested on first order half-lives. Uh, so that is accurate, but that is also different from previous years. Mechanisms and Catalyst, Chapter 16, all excluding Section 16.4. Uh, this is something that we did as we went along in lecture. So all of your lecture notes are fine and wonderful, uh, but 16.4 involves something called uh, Gibbs free energy. And we haven't done that yet. Um, so if you see something that says Gibbs free energy or even just Delta G, that's later. So don't worry, we'll get to it, uh, but later. Chapter 17 is where things start to get a little bit strange, uh, just because we are going to cover 17.1 to 17.5. You would be surprised how much of this is acids and bases uh, very similar to how you actually saw them back in Chapter 9. Um, so a fair amount of that is review uh, or is review with just a little added stuff to it. Um, and then this is the part that's a little bit strange, but this description is the way we cover it in lecture. Your textbook just talks about it in a different order than we do in lecture. Uh, so in lecture and in class, this should actually seem like all one story and seem pretty straightforward. Uh, the textbook part is a little bit strange just because the textbook separates acids and bases. Um, and so that's why you have this description down here at the bottom. So if we have time, we can get more into what that is. Uh, but honestly, you might be better off either looking through your lecture notes, uh, depending on whose section you have, uh, because the lecture notes, it's going to go in um, are designed in a chronological order way, uh, whereas the textbook's just a little bit weird there at the very end. Um, so before we get into questions, uh, so I know a lot of times I take questions at the very beginning, um, but I took questions from my class on Friday and hands down, almost all of the questions were about dealing with ice tables and dealing with equilibrium calculations and all of that. So what I actually did is we are actually going to start with one problem that I am going to work four times. Yeah, four times. I'm going to work this four times. Um, and I think that working the same problem, showcasing different problem solving techniques with the same problem should help answer some questions. Um, I know it won't solve everything, uh, but I think it'll help uh, at least start the conversation uh, and get us and get us going. Um, so we're going to, whoops, I forgot to, don't worry, I have the reaction. A uh, reaction as shown below. My bad. Um, supposed to be into as a gas plus O2, also as a gas, is in equilibria with 2NO as a gas. Uh, there's my reaction. What is the equilibrium concentration of the product? So that would be my um, nitrogen monoxide. Um, when your KC value is 1.5 times to the negative 10. 
So this is begging for an equilibrium calculation. So what we're going to do, there is my reaction. And I am sorry, that was supposed to be part of the problem. Um, that was probably about the time that I was writing this up and I suddenly realized I hadn't started Microsoft Teams yet because uh, I always restart my laptop before this so that everything's in better working order. <laughs> and then Teams is shut down and I'm like, oh, I'm going to need Microsoft Teams. So when we start this, uh, we have a first row for initial. The C stands for change. The E stands for equilibrium. So it says starts off with, and so starts off with could also say initially with 0 0.1 molar of each reactant. So it's going to be 0 0.1 here and 0 0.1 here. You'll notice that there's no mention of the product. So sometimes we remember to go ahead and say, oh, by the way, there is no product. But oftentimes, if the product is not mentioned, we can assume that it's zero. This is an assumption we actually made all the time. Um, even when we were doing kinetics uh, in the last chapter, we would be like, hey, you have the reactant and the reactant goes away over time and the product starts at zero uh, and gets formed over time. Um, when we were back in Gen Kim 1 and talking about reactions, it was a really normal assumption to say, hey, you start off with reactants and then you make the products. It's only now that we're in equilibria that everyone's kind of paranoid because you're like, I have to put something in all of these blanks. What are we doing? Uh, but if it's not mentioned, then you can assume that the product is zero. So we're going to assume that that product is zero for the change. Uh, and so I am first going to do this the way that most folks teach it in class. We will take a look at some of the things that Alex does in the next set. So I am going to work this problem four times. This is just the first one. So hold on to your hats because we're going to do this change stoichiometry two different ways, but we got to start with one of them. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to use the stoichiometric coefficients um, that are that are here. So this is going to be x and x and 2x. Um, so I have my stoichiometry. The other thing I need to do is put signs. Um, so if when I'm going to put signs, one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find my equilibrium arrow. Here it is and separate this because whatever's on the left is going to have the same sign as each other. So my reactants will have the same sign, whatever that is, and my product will have the opposite sign of the reactants. And if I had multiple products, they would all have the same sign, whatever that is. So I can separate these and they should have opposite signs from each other. Now, the way that we're going to figure this out is we're going to give a negative sign to whatever is disappearing. We're going to give a positive sign to anything that is appearing. Now, I know that most folks have completely forgotten that we did this, but we did this same idea in chapter 14 in kinetics. So the notion that things that are disappearing get a negative sign, things that are appearing get a positive sign, not new. We've done this before. Um, in this case, we can actually look at this without doing any math, although we can show off the math in a moment, just to reinforce things. What we know is there's a zero here in our table. Wherever that zero is, is where the positive sign has to be because we can't have any negative concentrations, okay? I, I can't owe the reaction an amount of nitrogen monoxide. I don't get to do that. Um, I can't owe it an amount of oxygen. Uh, so this is one of those times where I can also think about the fact that, um, I'm going to add my signs in here. So since I have a zero, whatever is in the same column as the zero has to have a positive sign. Because when we get into this equilibrium row, all I'm going to be doing is taking my initial plus my change to equal my equilibrium row. And so when I'm doing that, I need all of these in this last row to be positive values because this is all going to be, whether it's in pressure or whether it's in molarity, it doesn't matter. 
These all have to be positive values. You don't get to have, I should say, once you know X. So when we actually have a real number in there that should be positive. So two times X has to give me a positive value. OK, so we know that that one's positive. My reactants are disappearing, so they're going to get negative numbers. So again, I can either think about this as a reactants are disappearing, my product is appearing, but also notice that I've got this nice red vertical line and on opposite sides, I have opposite signs. So my product is appearing, it's positive. My reactants are disappearing, they're negative. I'm going to go ahead and finish out my equilibrium row, 0 0.1 minus x, because I'm just adding them together. 0 0.1, again, technically I could put positive plus negative x if it makes you feel better. Uh, that usually does not make people feel better, so I'm going to get rid of that. Um, but it is essentially just adding the first two rows together to get the equilibrium row. Okay, we have made one table. And again, we are going to do this uh, one other different way next time, but first this way. So only on one of four. Bear with me. So now the goal is to solve for the equilibrium concentration of the product. Um, so what I would really like to know is I would really like to know 2x. That's what I want. So in order to do that, I'm going to write my k expression. So just for good practice, I'm going to go ahead and write that k is equal to uh, since everything's in molarity, the concentration of uh, nitrogen monoxide squared on the top, so products on the top, reactants on the bottom, nitrogen on the bottom, oxygen on the bottom, those are raised to the first power. So here's my setup for K. KC is given in the problem, that 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10. So I can write that down. 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10 is equal to, this is going to be 2x. So I'm just using my equilibrium row now, because now we are just all about equilibrium. 0 0.1 minus x, 0 0.1 minus x. So all I did is take um, the KC expression that I can write from the chemical reaction that was given. I know it's in my handwriting, but it was supposed to be given in the problem. And then I'm just plugging in what I have, KC from the problem itself, everything else from the equilibrium row of the ice table. Okay. Now we solve. Now, this is also the reason I'm going to do this problem four times. What I am actually going to use this time is something that some folks have. I frankly don't know if you've seen it before or not, so I just, I won't say. Um, I'm going to do this, we're going to refer to this as uh, A, just so that later on when people ask me questions, I have a way to talk about this. Um, we're going to use the perfect square. So here, this 0 0.1 minus x and a 0 0.1 minus x, those are the same. So I can rewrite this. I can rewrite this as 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10 is equal to 2x all squared divided by 0 0.1 minus x all squared. Everything on the right hand side is squared, which means to solve this, I can just square root everything. So I can actually square root the right hand side, I can square root the left hand side, and when I do that, I look down at the notes that I prepared so that I copy this number correctly. Uh, 1.2247 times 10 to the negative fifth is equal to 2x divided by 0 0.1 minus x. There are different ways to do this algebra. I'm going to choose to basically multiply both sides by 0 0.1 minus x. Zero point one minus x equals two x.
this is that fun part where I'm like, did I do something wrong? Oh, I know what happened. Um, Because that is multiple. I did actually prepare ahead of time, then I panicked. Um, because I'm a little tired today. It's not an excuse. But that's fine. So now we're going to multiply that times point 1.2247 times 10 to the negative fifth times point 0.1. So that is 1.2247 times 10 to the negative six minus 1.2247 times 10 to the negative fifth equals 2x and then all we're going to do is we're going to get our uh, x we're going to get our x terms together by basically adding 1.2247 times 10 to the negative fifth x to both sides plus 1.2247 times 10 to the negative fifth x so that's 1.2247 times 10 to the negative six equals this really just becomes 2.1234122247 x divided by 1234122. Which should give me an x value of 6.1235 times 10 to the negative seventh. So there is my x value. Shoo, that took a while. Um, so from here, I have x. Yay, I have x. The grand question though is, what did the problem actually want? Oh, the problem actually wanted two times x. So since the problem actually wanted two times x, what I need to do is multiply by 2. So 2x is 1.2247 times 10 to the negative 6. Technically, this is all still in molarity. And that's my final answer. So there's 1. The next one I wanted to do, we're going to look at the exact same problem. The only thing we're going to do differently is we're going to do this table differently. So this is in fact going to be the same reaction. It's going to be the same starting concentrations. But one of the things that Alex did is Alex sometimes uses a different change row. And it's in exactly this setup of a problem that Alex uses a different change row. So I wanna go ahead and demonstrate that so you can see why Alex did that and what it looks like and that we're going to get the same answer. Um, but hopefully this will help with some of the questions uh, that I've been hearing recently. So this was still same reaction, N2 as a gas plus O2 as a gas is an equilibrium with 2NO as a gas. Still going to set up the table. Still says that we have same amount of initial concentrations, no information about the product, so that's a zero. My change row. Now, here's the part where Alex is different. Alex would be like, hey, you want to know about the equilibrium concentration of the product. That's the goal. So Alex would be like, sweet. We want equilibrium of NO to be X because that's the goal. So therefore, that's what we're going to solve for. And we're just going to algebra our way through everything else. Here's what that looks like. For the record, if you like the way I did the ice table above, I'm going to do it the other way for every other problem I work. I just want to show the folks that saw Alex do something weird, that it's okay. And if they like it, they can still use it. Um, after this, I am not gonna do it the Alex way. So this time and only this time. 
So Alex says, if that's what we're looking for, then that's what X is equal to. If that's X, then this is X, which means I'm still going to use stoichiometry, but since I already said that this has to be plus X, these have to be one half of X. Whoopsies, minus, 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 minus. Um, these have to be minus one half X. So I'm still using stoichiometry. I'm still using stoichiometry, uh, but instead of a two and ones, I'm using one and halves. Again, this is just what Alex did. Uh, so you don't, if you can't tell, I don't like this. Um, this is not the way I problem solve because to me, this requires thinking less like chemistry and more like algebra, and I don't like it. Um, but it works. It does work. Alex is not wrong. This works just fine. So all we have to do now is go ahead and do the same thing we did before. So this is still KC is equal to this. We're still going to use case in the same way. Products over reactants. And we're still just going to plug in. 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10, but we're going to use everything that's in our change row. I need a little bit more space. Um, scoot that down. So I'm just going to use whatever's in my change row. That's the name of the game. Thank you. Um, so this then becomes x squared divided by 0 0.1 minus 1 half x times 0 0.1 minus 1 half x. And I can still use the perfect square on this. It's the same setup. Uh, and that actually is what I'm going to do. So I actually am still going to solve this with a perfect square, mostly because that's the algebra I just did. And I would like to demonstrate the fact that if you use different coefficients, but with the same problem solving method, you're going to get the same thing. I square root that, I square root that. Uh, I unsurprisingly still get 1.224. 7 times 10 to the negative fifth, just like before. x divided by 0 0.1 minus 1 half x. Um, we can still distribute everything. Yay. Um, so this is still 0 0.2247 times 10 to the negative fifth. Times 0 0.1 minus 1 half x is equal to x. This is still 1.2247 times 10 to the negative six. Now this is slightly different. Um, minus uh, 6.1237 times 10 to the minus six, since that one half is equal to just x. Uh, now, since I've got this negative, I'm gonna add this to both sides. Six point one two three seven times 10 to the negative six negative six x, uh, I get 1.2247 times 10 to the negative six is equal to 1.12345, 6124x. I get x is equal to 1.2247, that's too many decimal places, times 10 to the negative six. Wait, negative six? One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, four. That should be, yep, the same. So 1.2247 times the negative six molar, that's too many decimal places, more than you would need and it is identical. And the only difference here is this is X and we made X be the thing we were actually looking for in the problem. So this, this then actually becomes my final answer because of the way we set up the ice table. So to recap, all I did is I worked this problem twice so far once by using the stoichiometric coefficients and all I did was drop the stoichiometric coefficients down. Once I solved for X, 
I plugged X back into the table to take a look at what X is supposed to mean and saw that, ah, for this problem, I actually need my answer to be 2X because that's what we set up in the table. The second time I did the problem, forgot to label it. This, this should be B. It's a perfect, it's, I still did the algebra perfect square, um, but I did this with uh, Alex uh, ice table. And Alex will go ahead and say, if this is the thing we're searching for, then let that be X. And we will algebra our way through the change row so that this is X. It is still using stoichiometry. Um, this, I think, is the main reason why people get confused is because sometimes when Alex is doing these problems, it goes ahead and just uses the stoichiometry and just drops the coefficients down into the change row, which is the way you're going to see me do it all the rest of the time. Other times, Alex uses algebra instead. I have actually officially complained <laughs> to Alex that students don't like this um, and that it's confusing. Uh, and I got some positive feedback from Alex on it, but it's not going to change in the next 24 hours. So you have to deal with it. Um, they did give me one option that if I have time to implement, I can do it pr probably a summer project for me though, um, because of the other things I haven't done yet. So that's two. Let me go ahead. I do have two more ways to work this problem, but I've been talking for about a half an hour. So let me go ahead and take some questions now and see where we're at. Um, I will, when we come back from, depending on what the questions are, uh, I may pause those questions just because uh, what I still want to do is showcase the other two problem solving methods because so far all I've done is perfect square. Uh, and the other two ways I was going to work the problem are with um, the quadratic formula, which I have written out here so that I double checked my algebra, uh, as well as the um, uh, x is small approximation. So I know I still have those coming, but before we do more algebra things, are there any questions so far? So we got a few questions so far. Uh, the first one is, would problems such as number seven on the Alex homework due this Thursday fall under the excluded equilibrium calculations for chapter 17? Um, with If you can put into the chat what that is, I can answer that question. Um, I can take a look at that, but it's going to take me a while to dig into the Alex homework. Um, also, I don't like logging into Alex when I'm on the live stream because what happens is usually someone's personal information pops up because Alex is trying to tell me about both the best students that I have in my class and the students most not doing great in the class and y'all don't need to see that information. Um, so if you can pop that question into the chat or if you would like to email me that question and take a screenshot of it that would be really helpful um, because I actually cannot and a oh, correction uh, I will not actually do that during the live stream because uh, Alex has I usually have issues sharing my screen when I do that the but next question oh, sorry no you're worse almost like oh, I'll make a note um, Alex <laughs> homework number seven okay other things All right. yeah the next question i believe you mentioned already but uh, someone asked can you go over chapter 17 and sure. <laughs> next is uh can you go over half lives please okay next is is there a certain value of kc less than a certain number that determines whether or not we can do the small x approximation for price tables excellent that is next up yep other things. Right. Next is, will we be uh, will we be required to come up with the equation for rice tables? 
Okay. Uh, can you go oh, can you go through the steps after you get rid of the per perfect square in de in depth, please? Say that one one more time. Yeah. So can you go through the steps after you get rid of the perfect square in depth, please? OK. Right. Other Next things. Is, uh, can you do an example with the equation KP equals KC RT power of or carrot delta N where delta N is negative? OK. Um, next is, can you demonstrate the 5% approximation? OK. Uh, next is, do we need to know mechanisms with a first fast step? OK. Uh, next is, will we be asked ion product constants, KW? OK. And the last one at the moment is, can you go over IE, uh, or is it LE, uh, Chatelier's principle? OK. Great. Uh, anything else right now? Uh, that is all for the moment. So, so I'm going to stick right now with what we, so you all notice I wrote these down. Um, so I will address as many of these as I can, but we are going to basically stick with the same topic we've been on for right now, uh, especially because one of these, um, so the steps after we get rid of the perfect square. Um, so I think that that person is asking about the algebra um, is, is my best guess. So when you say I got rid of the perfect square, um, my assumption is what you're asking me. And so this might be wrong. That might be wrong um, is basically with the perfect square, you square root both sides. Um, and whenever you so that that should be a button on your calculator. Um, if for whatever reason it's not, the other way you can always talk about a square root um, is there actually also fractional exponents. Um, so if I take this and I use a caret and then I take it to the one half power, um, this is the exact same thing as a square root um, or 10 to the negative 10 caret to the zero, 0 0.5 power. Uh, you get the exact same answer. So I square rooted both sides. That got rid of the squares here on my right hand side. Then since I have X here in the bottom half of my fraction, I basically multiplied both sides by 0 0.1 minus X. So that's how this 0 0.1 minus X wound up here on the left hand side, um, is I basically multiplied both sides by 0 0.1 minus X. Because of this minus, because it's a subtraction, um, I have to carry that entire expression together. So that's why all of that stays together as it moves over to the left hand side. Then I distributed. So I multiplied this number by 0 0.1 and I multiplied this number by negative X. And that's how I got this number and that number times X. It was still there. Then I did try to de demonstrate and show that when I moved these X terms to get the X terms onto the same side. Um, what I did is I added them. So since this is minus 1.2247 times 10 to the negative fifth X, uh, and this is a negative, I added that to both sides. So that's where that came from. Um, now the one weird thing is since this is times 10 to the negative five, um, suddenly my scientific notation went away because of the two. Uh, so I could have been writing this 1.2247 times 10 to the negative 5 out as a decimal the entire time, and that might have made these last two steps a little bit clearer because that would have been 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 2, 4, 7 times x. 
uh, which is why then when you added it to two, we got this final number down here. Uh, and then finally, I divided both sides by, uh, in this, so to go from the penultimate step to the last step, um, sorry, penultimate means second to last. Um, this is 0 0.2, ah, you take and you divide both sides by 2.00001227. One thing I will say, for the record, one thing I will say, um, and, and fo folks who have done any one-on-ones with me with math uh, have already heard this excuse or explanation. Um, personally, uh, I am not always the best person at speaking math out loud, uh, which is part of the reason why I scroll back so I could point to things and put things in red, um, because if whenever you describe math to me, if it's more than one step, I will almost always look at you, hopefully smile, and ask you to please write it down. That's actually for me, not for you. Uh, I don't process verbal mathematics very well. Um, so personally, I like to have it written down so that way we can look at it together. Um, and that way I make sure that I understand what you're saying because uh, I'm not the best at processing verbal mathematics. Um, so I'm really hoping that that answers the steps after the perfect square. Um, if not, try to ask your question again. I'm sorry if, if I misunderstood that. Um, also, if this was too fast, then we can certainly do it uh, again together and slower, but likely not in a review because likely what you need is for me to rewrite the whole thing back out again. Um, if, if you need more than that, um, because I know, I know that's a lot of algebra and I kept a bunch of, um, decimal places out, um, throughout all of that, but I'm going to go ahead and call that one answered. We'll see if you guys come back in the chat and tell me that I didn't. Um, this one, the equation for the rice table, um, this is another one that I, I think I understand this question but I might be wrong. Um, so this is another one that I'm going to attempt to answer, but in the case I have gotten it incorrect, please let me know. Um, so when you say the equation for the rice table, there are two different things I can think of and both of them are fair game. Um, so when you say the equation for the rice table, one of them you might mean is the chemical reaction. So it is fair game for us to say the following. Um, actually, I can, I type, I type faster. Why am I writing this by hand? My handwriting's not that good. And and I type faster than I write anyway. Um, there we go. Nitrogen gas reacts with hydrogen gas to produce ammonia gas um, if initially um, 1.0 atmospheres of nitrogen reacts with 1.0 atmospheres of hydrogen uh, what is the equilibrium pressure of ammonia um, given the KC, oh, we've done everything in pressures. We'll do KP. Why not? Um, given KP equals making up a number, um, 3.4 times 10 to the uh, fifth. Um, two fish breaks. So as far as coming up with the reaction on your own, um, we can do this as long as it's fair, fair game. Uh, and this is something where the fact that this is in two, back at, this is one of those things that actually is back from Jin Kim 1. There is a set of things that are diatomic that you are still responsible for. We still think that you know that nitrogen gas is diatomic at room temperature um, as at, in its standard state. 
Um, so that list of things that are diatomic that we think that you already know are diatomic, my favorite acronym for that is Brinkelhoff. So that's for bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Um, the other way, yes, sorry. I'm supposed to help myself out and have a periodic table over here. Um, but, you know, sometimes we know what's good for us and sometimes we don't do what's good for us. But I did, yay! Um, look at me eating my vegetables. Um, the other way to know that Brinkelhoff idea uh, is some people learned it as like a magnificent seven. Um, and so you basically take the periodic table and you can draw the number seven over here. So here's nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. That's supposed to look like the number seven. Uh, and sometimes they're like seven star because you also need hydrogen, which is over there. Um, so those, those are the two ways to remember the diatomic, the homonuclear diatomics that I learned. Um, I have definitely heard other people give me interesting mnemonic devices. If you would like a different mnemonic device because you don't like Brinkelhoff and you don't like seven star or star seven, whatever this is supposed to be, um, then either the internet is a great place or on Monday, ask the people around you in class because I am continually impressed with the number of different ways there are to memorize and remember things. Uh, that people have come up with. Um, and people will tell me more, but those are the only two that stick in my brain. So I appreciate the people that always give me more options, uh, but those are the only ones I remember. Uh, nitrogen, hydrogen, these are gases, it said so, to produce ammonia. Ammonia is the only thing aside from water that we think you know the, the formula for. And since I drew this from scratch, it's now balanced, so I have to balance it. Uh, two nitrogens, two nitrogens. Now there are six hydrogens, six hydrogens. So that's so that's one thing that that question might have been asking. Do we have to write the equation for the ice table? Uh, so we can ask you to do that. If we do, it should be something relatively short. Uh, but yes, we can. I chose this one specifically because of the, the additional assumptions it makes. Uh, so it has some nomenclature in there and it had the homonuclear diatomics. So that's why I chose this one was to try to think of different things that might come back. Um, the other thing that you might have meant by that when it said the equation uh, is after the table is made, the other thing that we're going to need uh, is that KP expression. And yes, you are definitely responsible for being able to take an equation and come up with the expression for uh, Kp or K, whichever K value it is, Kc or Kp, doesn't matter. Um, but yes, if this is the equation part that you meant, then you are definitely responsible for this. And we typically tend to ask you a question that just says, hey, here's a chemical reaction. Tell me what the expression, the equilibrium expression looks like. Um, and hopefully through Alex or end of chapter questions, y'all have gotten enough practice with the general products over reactants that this you've seen a bit before. So there's that one. So I'm not sure if it was trying to refer to the chemical reaction, but if it was, that answer is yes. Or if it was trying to refer to the actual K expression, if that's it, then double yes. Um, because on, honestly, a lot of times we'll give you the chemical reaction, but it's it's fair game for us to write it all in words. That's one of those difficult things that writing the K expression, we will definitely test you on. I promise we will test you on this one. Writing the chemical reaction from scratch, uh, it depends. Um, also, I did that thing again where uh, the exam questions are waiting in my inbox and I didn't look at them on purpose. Um, so, okay, so I think I've answered this one. Again, if I answered this one incorrectly, um, please let me know or try to rephrase your question because um, I did I did my best with that one, but it's entirely possible that I answered it wrong. 
Um, this one I'm not going to do right now. We talked about that. Um, small, x is small, x is small. Um, let's do that. So I'm going to use the same reaction <laughs> because this is one of my it's one of my 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 goals. Ah, da, 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 da. <sighs> so x is small. Um, as shown below, except that I didn't have enough time to write it out. It's supposed to look like this. Which are all supposed to be gases. Gases, 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 gases. Um, so do this one more time. Uh, I am going to write this ice table a bit faster just because it's the same problem we did before. One, zero. Uh, I do personally prefer, here's here's my zero, so I'm going to write 2x. I'm just going to drop that. Um, so basically, I'm going to fill out, hold on, I'm going to fill out this change row. Um, because of the zero here, I know that this is positive. And then because of the two that's right here, I'm going to put a two right here. So that's how I figure out the change row. Uh, so now that I have that, this is going to be minus x, minus x, 0 0.1, minus x, 0 0.1, minus x, 2x. AC is still equal to the concentration of NO squared divided by the concentration of nitrogen times the concentration of oxygen which means that this is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10 is equal to 2x all squared divided by 0 0.1 minus x, 0 0.1 minus x. So the x is small approximation. Here's the deal. Um, I'm gonna use the same analogy I used in class on Friday because it's my favorite analogy, um, which is, if we were trying to talk about something like a billion dollars, so if we were trying to talk about something like Jeff Bezos' wealth or Elon Musk's total wealth, and we call them billionaires, if we took away one dollar from each of them, one, one dollar, one, we would still consider them to be billionaires. The change of $1 is so small compared to a billion that we we don't care about it. It, it rounds away. Um, so when we talk about the X is small approximation, that's what we're trying to convey. That's what we're trying to talk about is the change is so small that we can actually assume that as long as we're either adding it or subtracting it, it doesn't matter. So part of how we can do that is looking at the value of K. Now, here's part of the weird thing. As long, oh, this one's got really straightforward stoichiometry. Um, as long as we're dealing with chapter 16, we can have all kinds of different stoichiometry. We're going to have a much more hard and fast rule for this when we get into chapter 17 and the ice tables in 17, because the stoichiometry in chapter 17 never changes. <laughs> never changes in 17. It'll change in 18. By the way, we're going to do ice tables for three chapters. Um, so, but as long as we're in acids and bases, that stoichiometry doesn't change. So we're going to have some more specific examples and some more specific rules in 17. Um, so the person that was talking about the 5%, um, the 5% rule, um, the 5% approximation, uh, the 5% five, five, five especially is actually, uh, an acid base rule. Um, specifically um, so that but that's what this ties into so that ties this ties into the same general story um, so what we're looking for is we're looking for a way to know that the change will be small 
Now, the tricky thing is, is that we haven't calculated anything, so it's awfully difficult to just figure out. But you can come up with like a, it's probably safe to make the assumption. Um, and you should go back and double check. But we can come up with like a, it's probably fine if. So what we're going to use for it's probably fine if is we are going to compare our value of K to our initial concentration. Because this is going to help us make the decision. We're also going to consider our value of K in the direction that we're going. So before we actually talk about the initial concentration, when we talk about our value of K, we can look at that and see that negative 10 to so this exponent here, and we know that we expect at the end to be mostly reactants. So when I'm talking about my final equilibrium row, I should have more reactants than I have products. That 10 to the negative 10 tells me this is a reactant favored equilibria. Since it's a reactant favored equilibria, that 2x is not going to be big. It should be really small. Um, so that so this part, what I'm trying to tell you is the phrase k is small in the direction we're going. What I mean by that is we know that we are producing products, but equilibrium says we're not going to produce a lot of them. So k is small and k is small in the direction we're going. It's a small equilibrium constant. It doesn't expect a lot of products. Products is what we're making. Notice that this would be different if we had the exact same setup. These are all gases. They're still gases. Um, if for some reason um, I had something like two molar here and I had none of these, but I still had a KC value of 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10. Now K is small, but I'm not going that way anymore. I'm not going forwards. Um, now I'm going this away. <laughs> I'm going, I'm going back to the reactants. Um, so since I'm going back to the reactants and I expect these values to be positive um, and this to be negative. If this is happening, then um, then K is not small in direction that we're going because we're going the opposite way. Um, so we could talk about this, but then basically what we would want to think about is that really this is like changing our reaction to go the opposite direction. And now for this K value, I would want that to be one over 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10. Uh, and K is not small in the direction we're going. So all I'm doing is demonstrating the fact that if I wanted to talk about this, this would be the direction I am going. And now K is large in the direction I'm going because I'm going to make products. Now that I switch this around, I'm going to make into an O2. Uh, and if I'm making into an O2 and I want to talk about my value of K as I'm making them as a product, we could talk about this as the reciprocal um, value of K. But that's that's why we say in the direction that we're going, because if we reversed everything now, that's not true anymore. You are responsible for this manipulation of K, by the way. So reversing the reaction and being able to come up with a value for K when the reaction is reversed, that's called manipulations of K. We covered it before we did ice tables. Okay, so K is small in the direction that we're going. So that is one hint. Uh, a lot of times, honestly, when your value for k gets to be something usually whenever i see like 10 to the negative 4 i get excited and i'm like ooh that's sure we can do it um if if it's especially 
like in the double digits? Oh, absolutely. Uh, 10, 10 to the negative six is like what I think of as the safe zone. Um, 10 to the negative four is like a probably zone. Um, is, is like a probably safe. Um, 10 to the negative six, oh yeah, this will work fine. Um, what we're usually actually comparing it to to try to figure out if the change is small enough is that initial concentration. Um, so I lost my train of thought talking about the direction we're going in. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to go ahead and do the calculation and then we'll come back and talk about that 5% um, that somebody else was curious about and reflect how that might demonstrate to us that this approximation is correct. So we're going to use the approximation. So here what we're doing is we're assuming that x is small. So this is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10 divided by, I'm going to distribute this. This is 4x squared. By the way, this is the biggest mistake that most people make on exams, is taking 2x all squared and making sure that 2x all squared is 4x. I'm not kidding. Um, by far, that's the biggest mistake that people make. So now we have this. Um, so 0 0.1 minus 0. So we're basically assuming that x is so small that it's essentially 0. So this is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10 equals 4x squared divided by 0 0.1, essentially squared. That's 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10, then times 0 0.01 is equal to 4x squared. Then this is the part that I did in advance. Where did it go? Yay, doing math ahead of time. Um, so this then is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 12th is equal to 4x squared. Then I can divide it by 4. I get 3.75 um, times 10 to the negative. I was, sorry, I, I did do this in advance and then I, I needed a snack. Um, and so I did this a little bit wrong, uh, but that's okay. That's okay. So we're going to square root everything. And as mentioned before, uh, we can either take the square root or we can also raise this to a fractional exponent. Um, your choice. This gets me x to be equal to 6.1237 times 10 to the negative 7. Um, what I am looking for is I still am looking for the concentration of the product. So I still would like 2x as my answer. In order to get 2x as my answer, that is going to be 1.2247 times 10 to the negative 6, just like it was before, like a half an hour ago. Same number. Um, so one of the questions was dealing with 5% or how do you know that the change is small enough? What we can do is um, we can always look at the change and the percent change. Um, so this is, we're going to just look at the change or the percent change. I'm not going to finish that sentence. It will not make me happy. It will not make you happy, actually. It will make me really happy. It won't make you happy at all. Um, because this is actually percent ionization. <laughs> it's, it's the same equation as percent ionization, like Dr. Diekman was trying to show y'all for the last exam. And you guys got really unhappy. So I realize that when I mumble to myself, it makes people nervous. Like, is it a secret? And I'm like, no, actually, it's not a secret. It's connecting things back to prior information. So all we're actually going to do to double check this is we are going to take my change and put it over my initial concentration. So I'm going to take these two numbers and make a fraction. That's what I'm going to do. Um, so my initial concentration is 0.1 molar. My change is X. So I'm going to take the value we got, 1.2247 times 10 to the negative 6, and divide it by 0 0.1, 
And since the person asked about percent, times 100%. Um, and as long as this number is less than five, then you're good to go. And it is, by the way, we can keep doing the math. 1.2247, I'm getting a little tired. I knew when I started off and I was like, I'm gonna do this problem four times. I was like, am I though? Am I really gonna do this four times? I think we're gonna get tired of this problem. <laughs> times 10 to the negative 10 times 100% needs to be less than 5%. I didn't multiply it by 100 yet, times 100. 1.2247 times 10 to the negative three, um, also known as 0 0.1212247. It's less than five, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and those of our non-binary folks, uh, to everybody in the crowd, regardless of gender, it's less, we're fine. Yay. Um, so, word of the wise. What we typically do is we typically have problems that have values of k that are usually greater than one. It's possible that we use a value of k that is still kind of small, um, but not small enough. Uh, so I actually was doing that on my workshop on Friday. Uh, and I was using values of K that are small, but not small enough. And I use things like 1.2 um, or 0.12. This is going to be small, but not small enough. Because this is still really pre pretty close to one. Um, and so this is th th this is more like taking away a dollar from me <laughs> um, or from my net worth. Eh. Um, I. Oh, cookie, maybe maybe I wouldn't notice a single dollar since I have random five dollar bills hanging around. Sorry, I just now realized my door was open because my dog undoubtedly knocked my um my doorstop out of the way. It's fine, it's fine. Um, but anyway, this is not small enough. This is this is not small enough. We would notice this change. Um, so this this value of k is not small enough. Uh, we would we would notice the change if it was not this small. So there, I know there's a little bit of wiggle room in the like, how do you know it's small enough? One thing that we strive for on exams is we typically strive to use values of K that are different enough from each other that making the choice is relatively straightforward. So be aware that yes, you're going to have some decisions to make, but typically we try to use small values of K so that it's relatively clear that the X is small approximation works. And then conversely, we try to use a large value of K when it won't work. So it's been another half an hour. What I'm going to actually look at is the questions I haven't answered. So the only version of this question I haven't done yet uh, is the quadratic. Uh, at this point, because I have done this three times so far and I haven't talked about any of the other things, um, I will go ahead and do the quadratic, but I'll do it in the afterwards video. Um, so if there are folks that wanted to see the quadratic, I, I did all the math for it out on my little notebook paper here, and I will do it in the video afterwards, because at this point, we're better off spending the next hour on not the quadratic equation, especially because most folks that would like to see me work out the quadratic are also going to want to pause the video uh, and look at the algebra for that really well. Um, so that's just to be easier if I do that afterwards. Um, that being said, you can still ask for questions in the chat uh, and I can do that. Um, so KC small, okay, so we did the small KC. We've done that one uh, and punting the Alex question. Um, what else can I do that's relatively quick? Um, okay, we did the 5% approximation because you, you, you can use the 5%. It's just weird sometimes with the stoichiometry and I typically think of that as an acid base rule. Um, but you, it still works. Um, it just seems strange to me. Um, let's actually do an example with the uh, KP KC because um, this is this is also a pretty straightforward one. So this 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 one I can do. Um, so I'm going to do this one since I still have questions I haven't answered yet. Um, 
that has a negative exponent. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, nothing, nothing I like better than like, and make sure that this problem that I haven't written yet works. Great. Um, oh, I know. Um, oh, but we did that one. Uh, don't overthink it. Don't overthink it. Just, 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 just do one. Um, we are going to go ahead and use the, the one I've already done. Um, 3H2 goes to 2 in H3. Um, so we are going to say that this has an original KC value um, equal to, I still don't know what this value is, um, but we haven't done this one. Uh, let's say that my KC value is 552. I don't know. Um, the really nice thing is K is temperature dependent. So in the back of my head, I'm always like, at the right temperature, I'm sure that this is the KC value. I just don't know what temperature is required, but I need a temperature. Crap, I am going to make stuff up, and I'm so sorry that this is not going to be accurate information. Um, we're going to assume that the temperature is um, 52 degrees Celsius. I don't know why suddenly I love 52, but I love it apparently. Um, and the question is, what's KP? So what we're going to do is use our handy dandy equation. KP is equal to KC times RT times the change in moles of gas. Um, so with this, uh, I have it memorized. You don't have to have it memorized. Off of the back page of the exam will be this value. And it'll even say that it's in liters, atmospheres, divided by moles Kelvin, uh, which will help remind you that you need to take that 52 degrees Celsius and add 273.15 Kelvin to it. Um, so you don't have to remember, it will actually be provided for you just like the change to Kelvin, 325.15 Kelvin. So I've got most of the information I need. Uh, now I need a change in moles of gas. So whenever we talk about change, change, just like when you guys did slope in algebra, rise over run, it's going to be equal to final minus initial. Just like when we were doing stuff last semester and we needed change, it was final minus initial or products minus reactants. So in this case, my products, this is supposed to be moles of gas. I am so sorry. This was also supposed to be all about gases because we're all about that gas, about that gas. OK, um, no solids. All right. Um, so products, my moles of gas in my products is two. My moles of gas in my reactants is three plus one, which is four. This gives me a negative two. So when I do this calculation, I've been writing really big, so hopefully you all can see it. It also means I have to scroll around a little bit to get my numbers. Uh, so KC is 552. R is off that back page, that potentially useful information page times the temperature in Kelvin that we solved for 325.15 all raised to the negative two power. So that's 552 times, uh, I get that inside part to be 26.68. Um, if you're not already familiar, I always give extra decimal places. Also, I try to write out all these steps because since uh, since I'm making this problem up as I go along, it's entirely possible that I'm wrong somewhere. And the more steps I write out, the easier we can figure out where I went wrong if I went wrong. Uh, then I'm just going to use my calculator. Uh, so so te technically, if I wanted to mess with that negative two exponent, I could rewrite with exponent rules what that also looks like. For anybody who's curious, uh, the negative means you basically stick it in the denominator, which we don't actually have right now. Uh, so it's actually going to be equal to 552 divided by 26.6818 squared. Those two things are the same. You don't need to know that. 
your calculator will do it for you. Yes, even these little TI 30X 2Ss, they do it great. It's fine. Um, I say it like that because I know some of you get mad because we took away your graphing calculators and uh, I've got to tell you, I don't care. Um, if you're ever curious why why we took away the why we ask you guys to do everything with a scientific calculator, ask me. Office hours, it's not short of a story. Um, times five fifty two. So it's a great office hour question. Why do we make you use these calculators? Whew. Solving for KP. Yeah, I solved for KP from KC. Hopefully that answers that question. Doing calculations. Okay. It's been more than half an hour since I took questions. I understand I have not answered all of the ones that were asked at 4.30, but in the case that some have come up over the past half an hour over the stuff that I have been doing, let me go ahead and take a break to ask if there are questions in the chat. So questions from the chat so far. We got a few more. The uh, first one is, will Arrhenius equation be on the exam? OK. Um, next is, uh, when can we use coefficients as exponents for the rate law? OK. Next is, can you go over number 15 from the 2019 exam? OK. Is can you solve the equilibrium question that you created with the nitrogen and hydrogen gas, please? <laughs> yep. Unsurprised. Yeah. Other things. Does the approximation method skill work if KC is very big? OK. Uh, does the approximation method only work if K is less than one? OK. And the last one at the moment is: Will there be quadrat quadrat? Yeah, will there be a quadratic question on the exam? Okay. Cool. Um, so some of these I can answer quickly. So I have not forgotten about the other ones. Part of the reason why I write them down, also because I have to. Um, so a Arrhenius equation? No. Um, no. Uh, we had our chance to ask you a conceptual question about the Arrhenius equation on the first exam. Um, so our, our opportunity to ask you a conceptual question is over. Um, and we were never going to ask you a calculation question about the Arrhenius. So no. So the time, the time for that concept is over uh, and we were never going to ask you about the calculation for that. Um, so that that one's easy. Um, as a, for, for me, <laughs> it's easy for me to answer. Um, coefficients as exponents uh, in the rate law. Um, you get to write your coefficients as exponents when they are elementary reactions. So either the phrase elementary reaction, that's one key phrase, so if you know that that's true, then you get to use the coefficients as exponents. Or if you're told that it's a mechanism. Um, so basically if because that, that that's what a mechanism is. Um, so if, if you have a reaction set up and they tell you, hey, um, here are the steps um, for the mechanism for the overall reaction, if they give you these, uh, if they give you the mechanism, you can assume that if this is the mechanism, uh, you assume that these are elementary steps. You assume one and two are elementary reactions. Uh, that's part of the definition. Um, so this is one of those times where part of the definition of a mechanism is to give elementary reactions to describe how the overall reaction is happening. Um, so those are the two ways you would know is either we flat out say this is an elementary reaction or 
you're given a mechanism for the overall reaction. And when you have a mechanism for the overall reaction, um, then those are those are elementary steps by default. So that one I can answer quickly. Ha ha. Um, I realize that there are more questions coming up about this now that I've opened that window, but I'm going to keep running down this list real quick to see what else I can I can say. Um, 15 on 2019 exam, uh, that'll be in a follow-up video. Um, I have a habit of doing anything on the 2019 exam in a follow-up video for two reasons. One, because if I mess up the calculation and it doesn't match the key, y'all will flip out. <laughs> um, and so I have to make sure, so I. I like to do that one in advance just to make sure that I can do all the calculations correctly because that way you guys won't flip out. Uh, and two, if somebody has not yet done the 2019 exam, I haven't spoiled anything and they still have the opportunity to go back and use it as a self-assessment for themselves. Um, so I will do that one in the follow-up video, but I will not do that one right now. Um, let me come back, solve the, solve the equation I wrote. Let me, I gotta find that again. Um, this one. No. Uh-uh. No. Um. Uh-uh. No. Uh, let me show you why. Um. I can't. Um. With without uh. What is that giant math program called? Um. So the only reason I, so this does have some good things that we can talk about, but this is not solvable with the tools we gave you. So I guess the question is, can I solve, can, can I solve the one I wrote? No, no, I can't. There, I answered the question. Um, no one's happy. Let's talk about it. So um, I went ahead and did this uh, value of K, which I'm going to save. I'm just going to take that. Uh, and we're going to make it smaller. Uh, and we're, uh, no, I wasn't done with you yet. Don't don't take away my tools. Um, we're going to lasso this again, and we're just going to move it over here. There we go. So here's the problem with this: um, is in the uh, whoa, draw tools, drawing tools. There we go. So in the ice table. I can still do an ice table for this. I have initially one atmosphere of nitrogen and I have one atmosphere of hydrogen. Uh, ammonia is not mentioned, so I can assume that that's zero. I can do a change row. So this is going to be 2x and this is going to be minus 3x and this is going to be minus x. And so this is 1 minus x and this is 1 minus 3x and this is 2x. Uh, and so then we're dealing with P, we're KP. So a couple of things. Um, one, this is huge and it's big in the direction we're going. Um, so X is not small. X is not small. It's not. Um, with, with this given value of KP. So I can't use the X to small approximation because it's not small and it's not small in the direction we're going. So this is, says, hey, you should have a lot of products. So I expect my change to be large. I can't use the X to small approximation. The other thing that I can't do, um, so this is 3.4 times 10 to the fifth. So I'm, I'm using this AP expression here that we already wrote out. Um, so this is 2X all squared divided by one minus an X that I can't get rid of divided by one minus three X cubed there's going to be an x to the fourth power in the denominator that I can't get rid of. We didn't give you any tools to do that. So we cannot ask you this question on an exam. We did not give you the tools to solve with this. Can't do it. Um, so that's, that's how I know that we can't solve this. Um, but that does help us answer some of those questions where so granted that's a giant value of k but essentially if your value of k is greater than one it's a good bet that this won't work 
that the x's small approximation will not work. And what you need is something like a quadratic or a perfect square. But both of those assume that the highest power of x will be 2. That's not true. So this is not a kind of question that we would give you on an exam. Um, I was just trying to use this as an example to show balancing and to show other things. Um, so chalk one up for I didn't prepare for that particular problem. Um, so therefore we wound up with something that's not solvable, but there you go. Sometimes that happens. Um, no, can't do it. Uh, approximation of K is large. Also, no. Uh, so if K is large, it won't do. Approximation K is greater than one. Um, I'm also going to go with no. Um, no. Sorry, I was thinking like, well, theoretically, if you had really big starting pressures, if K was like one, uh, but you had a pressure of like 10,000 atmospheres, we're not going to do that. We're not going to give you an initial pressure of 10,000 atmospheres and ask you to solve. It's not going to happen. Um, no, no, we're no. If you're ever in a situation where you have equipment that can get you to 10,000 atmospheres, um, that's a very special case. Um, the last one. So you can't use the quadratic if KC is large and basically if KC is, is, oh, sorry, the approximation, I think this was the question, if KC is greater than one. I'm so sorry. Uh, no, if KC is greater than one. Greater than one. Greater than one. They're always greater than zero. Come on, get your act together, Taylor. What's wrong with you? KC is, KC is greater than one. We're just going to go with no. Uh, if KC is less than one, yes, but KC is really, really small. Uh, so we can use the approximation uh, if KC is much less than one. We talked about that part already. That's yes. Put a yes right there. Okay. Quadratic on the exam. Um, so here's the thing. Here's the thing with the quadratic on the exam. Um, the problem that I've done three times now, but not four times yet, um, the fourth time is with the quadratic. There are people that don't like the approximation, but love the quadratic formula. It's okay if that's not you. It's also okay if that is you. So here's the thing. We will likely use the perfect square. I've done two examples of it. Granted, I know they were like an hour and a half ago, but I've done the perfect square for y'all twice. Um, we can absolutely do the perfect square. There are people that won't catch that it's a perfect square question. They won't notice that you can use the perfect square to solve for it, and they are going to wind up using the quadratic. There are other people that don't like the approximation and will use the quadratic as their defaults. So this question here is honestly one I can't answer uh, because I, I understand what you're asking. You would like to be reassured that quad, I could spell this correctly. Um, you, you would like to be reassured about how much algebra is required to do the exam. The tricky part is, is that we are pretty likely to do a perfect square. Um, and we will definitely rely on that approximation method, but some people won't catch those and they will instead default to the quadratic. So you will have students walk out of the exam, exam two and be like, there were no quadratics. And you will have other people walk out of there and say, I had to do it three times. Uh, I, I, I can't fix that. Um, there's nothing I can do about that. So that's part of the reason why we go ahead and we include it as a problem solving method, because it is. It's one more problem solving method that you can use. Um, and some people just don't recognize in the stress of the moment the pattern recognition for the other options. Stuff I can't do for you. So I understand the question. That ramble was my best answer. If you want a different answer, you can try to ask me again on Monday. 
see what I say? Probably sound really similar. Um, but that's what I got. Okay. That was a quick set of questions. Whew, can answer those. What do we have back over here? Um, so since I brought, uh, we haven't done any chapter 14 yet. Um, let's actually do some chapter 14 stuff because I didn't talk about mechanisms with fast step um, and half-lives. So let's actually do some of that. Um, and that'll also help reinforce. So the, the thing I had written previously is I wrote this. Um, so these, so this is step one. This is step two. Now, here's the thing, um, is as far as dealing with a fast step, so, so yeah, as far as dealing with the fast step goes, here's the deal. If I wanted to, I could write a question, and the question could say something like this. Um, I have to... Hold on, I have, to think, I have to think about this. I have to draw this thing real quick. Also, hopefully the AirPods are blocking out my dog because I don't know what's going on, but he's very excited about something in the background and I am sorry about that. Um, so I could have a question that just asks somehow, which one of these is the slow step? And which one of these is the fast step? If that's all I'm asking, this is fine. Um, so, so in this case, what we're going to do is we are trying to compare the activation energies of these two. Uh, and in this case, so the one on the left that happens first is step one. The one on the right that happens next is step two. Um, so that then relates to these two things. Um, and whatever the larger activation energy is, is the slow step. So here's my activation energy for the second step, my activation energy for the first step, my activation energy for the second step is bigger than the activation energy for the first step, which means the second step is slow, the first step is fast. I could definitely have a set of like true false statements up here that could also ask you things um, about if this is exothermic or endothermic. Um, this is exothermic because my products here are in lower energy than my reactants over here. Um, I could draw stuff and have talk about the fact that down here in the middle is my intermediate. Um, Sorry, my dog is begging for attention. Intermediate, I'm gonna spell that real quick. Um, where I've actually labeled one and two at those peaks, we could also actually label transition states. So all of this is fine. All of this is conceptual. All of this is fine. All of this is fair game as it's written. The one other thing that we could do with this as it's written is we could also ask you for the overall reaction. Uh, so to get the overall reaction, I could add these things together. Um, so this is, so since I have B on both sides, the Bs basically cancel out and I would have A goes to 2C and this would be my overall reaction. I could even go ahead and identify B as the intermediate because B is created in the beginning and used up. Uh, so B is actually my intermediate. All of this, fair game, and the second step is slow. The first step is fast. So I do understand that the person who asked the question about the first step being fast wasn't talking about this. I understand. But for the people that don't know what you're asking, sometimes it's nice to point out how you can ask a question with the with a first step being fast. All of this is fine. The part that's not fine 
which is likely the thing that the student was actually asking for, is I can't ask you for the rate law if the first step is fast. Because your book does cover that, but we didn't cover that in class. And we didn't cover that in class because it's about a 15 to 20 minute explanation for one, one thing and um we're not going to use it again this semester so we took it out um so we we don't do first fast steps with rate laws that being said um so so the thing that we won't do uh is we will not ask for the rate law when first step is fast so that's the only thing we won't do. We can do all the rest of it. We can we can connect it to a graph. We can ask for the overall reaction. Lots of things. Can't ask you for the rate law. Because the rate law would have to have an intermediate in it, except it can't have an intermediate in it, and that requires some, um, some fa fancy things. It's kind of fun, but we don't do it. Now that being said, Let's use a different example and show how we can ask about the rate law. Um, we're just going to use a different set of things. Uh, so we're going to use G plus H goes to I and I is going to go to um, H plus. I was going to use K because it's going on the alphabet, but no more K's. No more case. Um, y, H plus Y. Um, so this is step one. This is step two. And the first step is slow, which means the second step is fast. Now we can um, give the rate law and overall reaction. This we can do. So we're going to do the overall reaction. I just doesn't matter. We'll do them in order from left to right. Um, so when we ask you for the rate law, the rate law is always based on the slow step. So the rate law you can define by the slow step. Uh, I remember we talked briefly earlier about the fact that we can use the stoichiometric coefficients um, as long as they are elementary steps. And this is, I should have used more words, uh, but this is the mechanism since they show the individual steps. So these are uh, elementary reactions and we can write the rate law. Um, so this is just gonna be the rate is equal to K. This is a lowercase K times the concentration of G raised to the first power times the concentration of H raised to the first power. Um, so that is the rate law. Just using that as it is and i can also give the overall reaction uh, so the overall reaction um so what i'm looking for i am going to do it over here um my h's cancel out my i's cancel out and my overall reaction is just g goes to y so g goes to y is my overall reaction so this is my overall now the reason that I did this, I said earlier, and I meant it, that you can't put intermediates in the rate law. And that's still true. No intermediates in the rate law. It's a big no no. But H, it's not in the overall reaction, but it's in the elementary reaction. Whoa. Pink, pink on red. That was a bad choice. Bad choice, bad choice. Make a different color. Um, let's try this again. We'll just, we'll just go back to yellow. So H isn't an intermediate. H is in the very beginning of the reaction and it somehow is goes away, but then it's formed again in the end. So H is neither, so H is not lost as we've gone through all of this. So H is a catalyst. 
and catalysts do belong in the rate law because the concentration of the catalyst does affect the rate of your reaction. Um, so a catalyst should absolutely be in the rate law because it, it will determine how fast your reaction goes. Um, so catalysts do belong in rate laws. They should be there. Um, intermediates do not. So, but H is a catalyst. Everything is under control. Everything is fine. And in order to have to ask y'all to give us a rate law, the first step has to be slow. So in order to for us to ask you to give us a rate law, the first step has to be slow um, for the overall reaction. So it's the so that is the rate law for the overall reaction. The rate law for the overall reaction. So the rate law for the overall reaction is the same as the rate law for the slow step. Rate law for overall and slow step. So the whole the whole thing. The whole thing is the rate law. H is a catalyst. I'm looking at my own work and I'm like, I got a lot of arrows. Ooh, H is a catalyst. So H is a catalyst. That whole thing is the rate law for both the first step because it's slow and the overall reaction. We also call the slow step the rate determining step. So the slow step is also known as the rate determining step. Sometimes I forget to say that because those are both descriptions using the actual English language words, but I understand that sometimes we think that terms are fancy in chemistry, but all it means is that if that's the slow one, that's the rate determining step. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever tried to take the DART, the public transportation, um, either the buses or the trains, um, but there's a rate determining step in the train. Um, and the rate determining step is in, is the train or the train schedule. <laughs> um, I'm in pretty good control of how much time it takes me to get from here to there by car or by foot, um, but Anyway, the slow steps. The slow step is the train. The slow step is the train, not the car. The car is faster, which is why we don't have a lot of public transportation in Dallas because it's still faster to drive there with a car than the train. Anyway, that's not important right now, but the train will be the right determining step because it's the slow step. Turns out how fast you can get there. What other questions? Answer mechanisms with the first fast step. So we did talk about that. Um, ion product constant KW, that's a yes. Lachatle is principle, that's a yes. Sorry, this little thing means I have to see if I can save one note or not. Um, half lives, chapter 17. Um, but it is 540. Um, so let's go ahead and see if there are questions right now. I know I haven't answered all of them. Um, I am not going to be able to, but that's what the follow up video is for. Um, so I've talked for about a half an hour, so let's go ahead and take a pause and see what questions are in the chat. A few more questions now. Uh, the first question is, is KC equals KP uh, parentheses RT um, to the power of negative delta N correct? Yes. Sure. Okay. Yes. Other questions. All right. Other questions. Next is, do we use the slow elementary RXN or either one work? So does either one work? Okay. I can address that. Other things? Right. Uh, does not the EA2 line go to where the reactants are. Okay. I did that on purpose because it makes people mad. <laughs> but yes, I'll address that. 
<laughs> um, how do you find the activation energy of the overall reaction? OK, other things. Uh, do catalysts and intermediates both get canceled out in the overall reaction? OK. And the last one at the moment is first is first is the first step always slow. OK, fabulous. OK, start at the top. Um, so the question is, is this reaction, is this equation correct? Yes. Um, so real quick, I can show you guys the algebra because it, it's just an algebraic rearrangement. Um, so this is one of those times I was talking with somebody else um, earlier this week and they're like, is there another equation for this? And I'm like, well, yeah, but I don't know that it's going to make you feel any better um, because here, here's the one I did before. Kp is equal to Kc times in parentheses Rt all raised to the change in moles of gas. If I want to solve for Kc, I can. Um, all I'm going to do is divide both sides by Rt times change in moles of gas. Divide by Rt times change in moles of gas. And so what I have is I then have Kp divided by, uh, so then these would cancel, and then I have Kp divided by Rt times the change in moles of gas is equal to Kc. But that's a fraction, and no one likes fractions, so we'll pull it up. So just like, by the way, when the unit is grams per mole, and we rewrite that as grams per mole to the negative one power. That's all they're doing um, is this then becomes Kp times Rt raised to the negative change in moles of gas is equal to Kc. It's, it's an algebraic rearrangement. Um, so if you like the algebraic rearrangement, you are welcome to use it. Personally, I think that it's easier to just memorize one formula um, and I I do prefer the one without the negative exponent again I I have the microphone so that's my personal preference um oh, the one we oh the one I wrote all over so it's gone um so my my personal preference is the k kp is equal to kc times rt uh to the change in moles of gas this is my personal preference, um, but it, if you want to memorize them both, you can, uh, but it's ju it's just algebra. Uh, but in general, y'all have done things where if you wanted KC, but you had KP, you just plug in the numbers and then you just solve for KC instead of the other one. So. We, we've done this to you before when we were back in chapter 13 and we had things like the freezing point depression equation and we could have you solve for the change in temperature, but we could also have you solve for the molality. We didn't give you a different equation that rearranged everything uh, just because you were solving for a different variable. But if you would like to have it, it's there on the screen. You're certainly welcome to use it. They're both valid, but they're, they're just algebraic rearrangements of the same thing. But yes, it is. It is correct. It's it's just algebra. OK, other things. Um, I think this was. Oh, crap. Uh, slow elementary reaction. No, what's it mean? Oh, God, I thought I would remember. Oh, I'm going to have you guys read that one to me again because I forgot what this question was. Now that I said all that. Oh, what is this? Um, I'll go ahead and talk about activation energy. Um, so, so I drew the activation energy steps correctly. I promise you, I did. Um, I know you don't like it when I do that, but I promise you I drew them correctly. Um, also, word to the wise, whenever, whenever I say that, I'm trying really hard to not be condescending because 
the people that are in my section are aware of the fact that I mess up and I appreciate it when you double check me. So I do appreciate the fact that you're like, Dr. Taylor, are you sure? You said you were tired. You sure you didn't just do that wrong? So I, I do appreciate the double checking. I really honestly do. Um, I like y'all to think critically um, and I, I like you to double check. So, so I appreciate you asking. Um, let's draw a different one of these just to show you how weird this can get. Da, 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 da. Oh no, I can do this better. I can do this better. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, I had one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, wait, no, no, I don't work my form time. Sorry, 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 sorry. There's a point I want to make quite desperately. There it is. Aha. So because what we're trying to talk about is the activation energy for an individual step, and this is also going to help with the question that was asking about the activation energy of the overall reaction, what we care about when we're doing mechanisms is we're trying to describe the activation energy of individual steps. So we want to talk about the activation energy of step one. Step one has a beginning and an ending. Step one starts with reactants. And step one actually ends with the intermediate. That's the beginning and the ending of step one. So step one starts with reactants and stops at the intermediate stage. Um, so this is one of the things with intermediates is intermediates are stable enough that you can usually isolate them. You can usually hold them in your hand. There are things that we can draw out. They're kind of stable. So the activation energy for the first step does start at the reactants and go to the top of the hill. The thing is, though, is that for step two, step two is going to start where step one left off. It's going to start with intermediates, and maybe some other stuff is getting added. That's possible, um, but it's going to start at the intermediate and go from there. And this is the activation energy for the second step. I know that bothers you, and I know you don't like it, but that's how this works. We don't actually describe the activation energy of the overall reaction unless it's a one step reaction. So I'm not going to get rid of that completely. Um, so we can describe the activation energy of the reaction if there's only one step. So in this case, I can go ahead and talk about the activation energy because there's only one of them. So if there's only a one step mechanism, a one step reaction, then I can talk about the activation energy of the reaction, um, but only under that scenario. That's part of the reason why we often keep trying to bring back things like um, delta H and we keep trying to bring back this exothermic versus endothermic thing because you can always do that for the overall reaction no matter what. So we can always talk about the fact that this should be a positive delta H which would be endothermic uh, and that this one here would be a negative delta H which would be exothermic. Um, so exothermic, endothermic, we can always do those. That's not a problem. Um, but the other ones, uh, the activation energy, you can only do an overall activation energy when it's one step. And yeah, I know writing them like this is not normal. So I know y'all don't like it, but this is that's that thing where you can do it that way. Um, a lot of times we don't show it like that because it's easier to do it other ways in the book. Um, the book does actually still display that. Um, I wonder if I can find it fast enough. Oh, there it is. Um, I'll say. I'm going to try to grab the picture out of the book really quickly. Uh, where's my two-step two -step mechanism? Um, so there's my two-step mechanism. Um, and so even the textbook slides do actually show that the second step does begin at the intermediate and goes to the top of the hill. 
So again, I know you don't like it. I know it looks weird. It is correct. Where was my list of questions? Oh no. The reason I don't play certain video games, I get lost. Uh oh. Oh, there, there they are. There. Okay. So we talked about the second activation energy. Did this one. We talked about the energy of the all. Um, is the first step always slow? Um, so I'll get to the catalyst again. Uh, is the first step always slow? So I'll try to say that one again. Uh, so basically, the first, if we're doing things conceptually, where we're not asking you to give a rate law, um, the first step does not have to be slow if we're just drawing graphs. If we're drawing reaction coordinate diagrams with the humps, first step does not have to be slow. Um, the first step has to be slow if we're going to ask you for the rate law. Um, so if we're going to ask you for to determine the rate law of the overall reaction, um, then the first step has to be slow. So that's where this came into play, is, is that the first step has to be slow if we're going to ask you to determine the rate law of the overall reaction. Because there is a way to determine the rate law if the first step is fast, but that's not something that we covered in class. Um, it is in your textbook, so it is doable, but it's not something that we covered. Uh, the last thing, which technically I can answer with a simple yes, uh, but to, I, I'm just going to redraw this uh, because this has both of the things that I would like to talk about uh, to answer someone's question is, so I wrote G plus H goes to I, and then I wrote, I just wrote I, yeah, I goes to H plus Y. Um, so, we already mentioned the fact, but I'll just go ahead and say it again. H is there in the beginning, and then it's there at the end. So therefore, H is a catalyst. It's there in the beginning. It shows up at the end. H is what we call a catalyst. I is an intermediate. Um, it's made, it's created in the first step, and then it's used up. So it didn't exist in our initial set of stuff that we were given, and it goes away before we have our final set of products. Um, so I is what we refer to. So I is an intermediate. Both of them, and I think this was the actual question that was asked, uh, both of them when we go to the overall reaction do cancel out. Um, so you are absolutely right that both catalysts and intermediates get canceled out from the overall reaction. And so therefore, neither one are present in the overall reaction. So that part is correct. Um, but a lot of times we do ask y'all questions to differentiate between intermediates and catalysts. Um, so do, do be on the lookout for the differences in between those two, because oftentimes that's a, a common source of confusion and often an exam question. Maybe I'm sorry. I would say I should start writing these down on a separate piece of paper, uh, except that I like y'all to also see what I'm looking at. Um, so, I really hope that the slow that the slow elementary reaction question was answered by some of this conversation about fast steps and slow steps. If not, that's my fault. Please either ask that question again or email it to me uh, because it, it is my fault that I thought I wrote down enough words that I would remember what that was, and I did not. Um, so you have my apologies if I failed to answer that question. Um, I think I did, but I might not have. Um, Okay, so we talked about catalysts and overall reaction. We talked about the first step always being slow. If it's a rate, if we're asking you for um, overall, if we're asking for the rate law of the overall reaction, then yes. 
but if we're just doing conceptual stuff, not necessarily. We talked about quadratic on the exam. I actually did all those except for number 15 on the 2019 exam. Um, got five minutes left. In five minutes, let's actually do just a little bit of chapter 17. Um, but we're actually going to start in a weird place. Um, so chapter 17 is acids and bases. Um, so there is a variety of stuff to do in chapter 17. Um, so, but let, let's, let's chit chat for again, I got, now I got four minutes. Um, let's just chit chat a little bit about 17. So obviously in four minutes, I cannot cover everything, right? Obviously. Um, but we can talk about acids and bases. Um, so the thing is, is we're going to be applying acids and bases and acids and bases back to equilibria. So we introduced some things back in chapter nine. So back in chapter nine, we talked about the definition of an acid and a base. So we talked about the Bronsted definition. The Bronsted definition was the notion that acids were proton donors, bases were proton acceptors. So we could have a reaction. Um, come on, brain. Um, so we could have a, a reaction like this where I have uh, hydroiodic acid plus water. Um, and I could say that out of this, I'm going to get H3O plus and I'm going to get I minus. And the and basically there is this proton that is H plus that started with the hydroiodic acid and it moved to the water. So that's why, how I got H3O plus and then the thing that was remaining was this um, iodide ion. So I can refer to HI as an acid. I can refer to water as a base because the water accepts the proton. Now, the thing that's going to be different, the thing that we are, so, th so that is all chapter nine. That's all actually old stuff. The part that's new that we haven't talked about before, so now that we're doing reactions in reverse, as well as forward, we should also like to think about the fact that now that this proton is on the hydronium ion, this is an acid. But since it relates to the base, we don't just call it an acid anymore. We call this the conjugate acid. And we would refer to I minus not as the base because it relates to HI. This is then referred to as the conjugate base. And that notion is just trying to tie those chemical species together because all that's happening is this proton is being exchanged. Uh, when I do this on Monday, there's a hat I usually use. I'm looking around my room. I'd really like a hat right now. Um, I have this dinosaur <laughs> with the little bunny ears. So if this is my proton, it starts off with HI and HI has the dinosaur with the proton and then it gives it to the water. Hey, look, I actually have water. Um, I don't want my dinosaur to get wet. Um, but the dinosaur is going to hang out with the water. Um, so when that transfer happens, this is now the conjugate acid because the dinosaur is my proton. Dinosaurs are awesome, so why not? The dinosaur is my proton. Um, and so now that the proton is hanging out with the water, this is now my conjugate acid species. This is my hydronium ion. And I, me, I, like I planned this almost, the iodide ion, I don't have the dinosaur anymore, so I lost the proton. So I am now a conjugate base. This is a conjugate acid. If I could take it back, I could be HI again. And this is just water again. Um, so that's a little teeny tiny bit of chapter 17, both trying to think about how we did think about acids and bases back in chapter nine, talking about the Bronsted theory of acids and bases and proton donating and accepting, 
and the fact that we're going to tie that back into reversible reactions and add a little bit of language talking about conjugate acids and conjugate bases. So there's there's four minutes, your four minutes worth of chapter 17. Um, so it is six o'clock. Uh, if there are other questions in the chat, I will be making that follow up video. Because uh, like I mentioned, um, I don't like to do uh, 2019 exam questions during the actual uh, live event. So that way uh, folks don't have to try to make the decision of trying to save that for um, their own personal practice. And when I make the follow up video, that 2019 problem will actually be the last thing that I do for that same reason. Uh, I'll give you guys a little bit of warning and pause a little bit so that if you haven't gotten the chance to try out the 2019 exam as practice, you'll have still have that opportunity. Okay, but it's six o'clock, so I think we're done unless you guys found like super short questions in the chat, but usually usually it's six o'clock and everybody's tired. It looks like um only question left appears to be why doesn't why appear in the rate law? Uh, why does not appear in the rate law? Because rate law is a product. Um, so also for us, rate law is also part of the fast step. Um, and so for this particular thing, we don't need why because it's in the fast step. Um, so we don't need that at all. Uh, but, and this is that hard part where like, gosh, it's been so long since we did rate laws. Um, way, way back um, when we were doing information that had to do with rate laws uh, and we would tell you that there was a reaction and there would be information in a table um, and we would ask you to figure out like what's going on with the rate law um, and there would be this kind of a thing going on and this would be like point one and this would be point one and this would be point two and this would be point one and this would be zero i don't know point one and this would be zero point two and you would have a rate of like one two four something whatever this was your reaction and this is that part that I don't know if you remember. The reaction that this went with would actually be A plus B goes to C. And you would have no information on C. You would have no information on the product. And any time that we were writing rate laws, the rate law was always based on the reactants. This has to do with the idea that when we're trying to talk about how fast does a reaction go, what we care about are those starting materials. So when we're talking about how fast a rate law, a, rate, a reaction goes, we care about the starting materials. Um, so that's why the product's not included in the overall, in, in the rate law for the overall reaction. Um, now, for those of you that have looked in the book um, and have perhaps seen what happens when your first step is fast and your second step is slow, other things happen because then we have to consider the reverse reaction of certain things and then sometimes you do wind up with products in your rate law but that again is not something that we've covered so therefore it is not something that we'll test on um, so there are more potential cases but again not things that we covered this semester other things that appears to be all at the moment. Okay. Sounds good. Then in that case, it is 6 p.m. I'm going to scroll. I will be making that follow-up video. I'm going to scroll back to the fact of what the exam to content is. It's, again, I copy, I, I took a screenshot of this out of the 701 section. <laughs> so you're welcome to screenshot it again if you want. Um, but this, this came out of the 701 section announcement that Dr. Diekman made back on Thursday, February 23rd, 2023 at uh, 9.52 a.m. <laughs> you got the screenshot show. <laughs> and that's it for tonight. All right, awesome. Thank you very much uh, to everyone who attended. Please be on the lookout for the recording of this one, as well as the follow-up video to come out in the coming days. We wish you all the best of luck on your exams. Thank you.